Uh, so I was going to use an updated version of the presentation, but I'll make do with what we have. So first of all, I just want to thank my mentor, Dr. James H. McCutcheon, as well as Center for Limnology and Sirius for assisting me with my research this summer. So first point I want to make is that there's a lot of variation in uh, transparency in any type of lake system. Uh, on the left, you have a photo of Chasm Lake. Uh, you can see it's very clear. There's a lot of light transmission. And on the right, you have a photo of Litter Gainer Lake. And it has a lot of heavy suspended sediment particles that are blocking the light transmission. So this just gives you an idea for uh, the variation in transparency. So transparency is important for a number of different reasons. Uh, it affects light transmission. This can affect the growth of algae. And uh, the algae are the primary producers or the primary energy source for the hyotrophic structures. So if you have a significant decrease in total suspended solid, or sorry, uh, transparency, that can uh, negatively affect the hyotrophic structures. In addition, it's also an aesthetic concern. Uh, for example, Grand Lake, um, if uh, there's a decrease in transparency, uh, this can affect the um, aesthetic appeal and the income generated uh, via tourism. Uh, in addition, it can also affect uh, drinking water quality. Grand Lake is part of the uh, CBT project, and it um, provides water for over 900,000 people. So uh, suspended particles can control transparency. If you uh, look at this figure here on the left, this is uh, Secchi depth uh, transparency in meters. On the y-axis, it's a log transformed y-axis. Total suspended solids in uh, milligrams per liter on a log transformed x-axis. And so as particle concentrations increase, uh, transparency decreases. And essentially, this just represents historical data from Green Mountain Reservoir, Grand Lake, Shadow Mountain Reservoir, and Dillon Lake. And what they all display is a strong negative correlation between uh, transparency and total suspended solids. So total suspended solids as a variable uh, provide a good basis for kind of measuring transparency in a lake. Uh, over here on the right, we have a picture of a Secchi disk. Um, this uh, can measure the uh, transparency in a lake, as I've stated, and it just gives you an idea for what it looks like. So Crater Gulch Watershed was the uh, area of interest that I was studying. Uh, it <coughs> is a source of suspended, it may be an important source of suspended sediment particles affecting transparency in Grand Lake. Uh, it only makes up about 3% of the watershed area above uh, Shadow Mountain Reservoir, but despite its small area, it still displays high particle concentrations uh, during periods of high discharge. It's uh, also a source of volcanic ash deposits that are rich in phosphorus, and in addition, um, it, can, it is at a higher elevation, and there's less vegetation to retain the soil, so you have higher rates of soil erosion in this Crater Gulch watershed. And the purpose of this uh, study was to investigate its role in Grand Lake transparency. So uh, in terms of the, uh, the frequency, duration, locations, uh, two samples, uh, water samples were collected in 1,000 milliliter bottles per field site. Uh, and this was done uh, each week over a weekly, or on a weekly interval for uh, four weeks. And the study included four sites ranging in elevation from uh, 8,367 to 9,500 feet. And just to give you an idea for the location, Grand Lake is uh, located 46 miles from Estes Park, uh, Colorado, and that cuts through Trail Ridge Road uh, uh, via Rocky Mountain National Park. And let's see. So here is, uh, you have CRU at the top, CRG, and CRD and CRS. That's Colorado Upstream Site, CRG is Crater Gulch Site, CRD is Colorado River Downstream Site, and CRS is Colorado River Shadow Mountain Site. They're listed sequentially in order of elevation along the Colorado River, and all of their watershed contents feed into Shadow Mountain Reservoir, as well as uh, Grand Lake. And this is just a, a large-scale uh, map cut out of Google Earth, and you can just kind of get a, a sense for where its location is relative to Denver, Colorado Springs, and just the Front Range in general. So, we used um, a mechanical current meter uh, to measure vertical subsections of the stream in order to determine its uh, average velocity and depth. And in addition, we recorded some other variables like date, weather, time, and a field notebook. Uh, we took the suspended particles from collected samples. We put them on glass fiber filters. We then weighed the filters to determine particle concentration. We also used an acid molybdate method uh, based on applied uh, photospectrometry, or uh, sorry, 
uh, spectrophotometry, um, and this allows us to determine the phosphorus concentration in both particulate and dissolved form. We can then take those two variables to uh, and sum them together to get total phosphorus. Uh, we also used uh, reagents, and that combines with the phosphorus to make this blue dye, and uh, the amount of blue dye is proportionate to the phosphorus concentration. Uh, we also uh, multiplied uh, stream discharge by particle concentrations for each site uh, in order to um, get the total suspended solids and uh, total uh, phosphorus mass transport. So we took that data and then we graphically analyzed it. So um, I just want to start here uh, with the figure on the left. And essentially, um, Crater Gulch is displayed here in blue. And across all the sites, the discharge declined over the study period after peak snowmelt. And right before the last sampling date, there was a small afternoon thunderstorm, which kind of spiked the flow just a little bit. However, it didn't really have a measurable effect on Crater Gulch. When you look here, we have uh, total suspended solids uh, in milligrams per liter on the y-axis and date on the x-axis. And uh, you can see that a small afternoon thunderstorm kind of spiked the uh, concentration just slightly, but there wasn't enough local precipitation to significantly increase the total suspended solids for Crater Gulch. If we look here on the graph to the left, we have total suspended solids in milligrams per liter on the log transformed y-axis, discharge in meters cubed per second on uh, log transformed x-axis. And uh, over this period of time for each individual site, uh, as discharge increases, the particle concentrations increase as well. So for a given discharge value, if you look here at the blue concentration, you can see that Crater Gulch has a higher particle concentration in comparison with the other sites. And if you look uh, at this figure on the right, we have total particulate phosphorus in micrograms per liter on the y-axis and then date on the x-axis. And what we can see is uh, changes in particulate phosphorus over time are very similar to the changes that we saw in total suspended solids. So as the particle concentrations increase, the total particulate phosphorus increases as well. So once again, the total particulate phosphorus concentrations declined over the study period after peak snowmelt. Looking here, we have uh, total particulate phosphorus in micrograms per liter on the log transformed y-axis, discharge in meters cubed uh, per second on log transformed x-axis. And uh, what's interesting is that Crater Gulch tends to be, uh, the particle uh, particulate phosphorus in Crater Gulch tends to be higher for a given concentration, even though it displays a lower discharge in comparison with the other sites. And if you look here um, on this table, we have the mass transport of total suspended solids and the mass transport of total phosphorus in kilograms. And CRG, or Crater Gulch, only made up about 3% of the uh, total mass transport of TSS and total phosphorus flowing into Shadow Mountain Reservoir. So what can we conclude from this? Well, across all the sites, um, discharge and particle concentrations declined over the study period after peak snowmelt. And Crater Gulch displayed higher particle concentrations in, compared, in comparison with some of the other sites. But the particle concentrations at some of the most downstream sites were still moderately high. And this is most likely due to the fact that they're in closer proximity to human activity where you have higher industrial, agricultural, and domestic inputs of phosphorus waste. Um, in addition, precipitation was very low in comparison with the average year. If we had had a higher frequency of localized precipitation events over the Crater Gulch watershed area, we probably would have seen a resulting uh, higher particle uh, discharge, or we would have seen a, re a higher resulting uh, discharge and uh, particle concentration. So, uh, Crater Gulch uh, accounted for less than 10% of the particles reaching Shadow Mountain Reservoir over the study period. And it didn't greatly affect transparency in Grand Lake over the study period. However, on the basis of historical data, concentrations have, uh, the particle concentrations coming from Crater Gulch watershed have typically been 100 to 1,000 times uh, higher than the 20 milligram, 20 microgram per liter range uh, that was measured with these variables over the study period. And so um, the effect would probably be greater during uh, uh, summer with stronger thunderstorms and higher precipitation. So the role of uh, Crater Gulch in delivering particles and phosphorus to Shadow Mountain Reservoir can vary significantly over time, depending on thunderstorm frequency and precipitation events in that area. And if we really wanted to get an accurate uh, estimation of the range and variation and the total mass transport contribution to Shadow Mountain Reservoir, we'd have to scale this study over a number of years. Thank you. <laughs>